Thank you, Dr. Big. Good morning, everyone. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here and speak with you today about neurosarcoidosis. Um, I'm here filling in very big shoes of Dr. David Cliff Clifford, who's out of the country right now, but wishes that he could have been here. Um, but uh, I'm certainly happy to be here. I'm um, in my last year of my adult neurology residency at Washington University. And so my interactions with neurosarcoidosis patients have included patients that I've treated in the hospital um, and they've come in with complications. And I've also treated patients in clinic with Dr. Clifford and I'm gonna be doing a fellowship with him next year. Um, have no conflicts or disclosures. So today I'm going to talk to you about you know, what is neurosarcoid, what are some of the clinical signs and symptoms, how do we diagnose it, uh, what are some of the treatment strategies, and um, where do we go from here in terms of uh, future therapies. So as, as Dr. Nyack sort of talked about, one of the, you know, the hallmarks of sarcoid is the granulomatous pathology um, and uh, that is true for neurosarcoidosis. Um, so neurosarcoidosis is an inflammatory granulomatous disease within the nervous system um, such as in the brain or the spinal cord um, and so in addition to neurologists um, these patients are seen by rheumatologists, ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, pulmonologists, internal medicine doctors, sometimes neurosurgeons, um, so it's a very multidisciplinary approach um, because these patients often have multiple organ systems involved um, in addition to the brain or spinal cord. Um, they can have very disabling sim symptoms and sometimes the disease can be fatal. Um, and currently, there are no FDA-approved treatments so um, just to kind of summarize again, um, sarcoidosis, um, it is a multi-system granulomatous disorder um, that as of yet we don't fully understand you know, what causes it. Most commonly affecting young adults, um, very commonly involves the lungs as well as the skin and the eyes. Um, diagnosis is made um, by both clinical and radiographic evidence as well as pathology that shows these granulomas in, uh, um, in one or more organs and frequently affects the lung, eyes, skin, muscle, heart, and kidney. Um, so when we think about what might cause sarcoid, um, some hypotheses have suggested that in certain people maybe they were exposed to a particular infection or something in the environment or a chemical of some sort that then set off the immune response, um, causing the release of inflammatory molecules um, that then further led to um, activation of the immune system and these formation of granulomas in different tissues in the body. And in some people, those granulomas can resolve over time and they don't have a long-standing um, problem versus other patients that it's, uh, tend to have a more um, chronic disease and fibrosis within organ systems. Um, and then there's also, um, as Dr. Nyack alluded to, um, thought to be a genetic component so that, you know, not all patients exposed to these various things will, will um, develop sarcoid. It's like a combination of genetics and environment. So just to talk about kind of the prevalence of neurosarcoid, when we think about sarcoid, prevalence is estimated to be about 40 per 100,000 people. Um, and neurosarcoidosis, the prevalence is less than that, about two to six per 100,000 people. Um, it's estimated that about five to 10% of people that have systemic sarcoid will also have nervous system involvement. So not entirely uncommon. Um, that if a person has sarcoid, that they may end up developing um, neuro, neurologic complications. Isolated neurosarcoid is thought to be much more rare, um, 0.2 people per 100,000. Um, and just to kind of put us in context, when we think about the disease multiple sclerosis, um, which commonly affects the nervous system, um, that's estimated to be about 175 per 100,000 people. Um, 
We see um, at WashU, we have about um, 60 patients or so that we are currently treating for neurosarcoidosis and get about five to 10 new cases per year. So this slide is kind of busy, but it's just to point out that down here, looking at multiple sclerosis for comparison, this study had 167 um, multiple sclerosis patients in it, and they spent a total number of about 700 days in the hospital during the course of this study. They had about 100 MRIs, 100 invasive procedures, and about almost 4,000 laboratory tests. Uh, by comparison, there, there were only nine neurosarcoidosis patients in this study, but you can see they spent about half the amount of hospital days um, compared to MS, so they tend to have longer hospitalizations. They had more days in the ICU. They had um, a higher relative number of MRIs and basic procedures um, and had only a third of the laboratory um, tests that the MS patients did. So it's a very, um, it's a bit large burden for patients in terms of tests and procedures and imaging. Um, and it's also just kind of a burden on healthcare um, in general. So it's uh, important to understand that. So some of the clinical manifestations that we see in sarcoid, um, it very commonly can affect the cranial nerves. So things like facial weakness, vision loss, hearing, lo hearing loss, or things that we see the cranial uh, nerve seven is the most commonly involved in neurosarcoid. Um, it can also affect the covering of the brain, the meninges, and cause meningitis. It can affect the spinal cord, anywhere along the spinal cord. And this can be a rather serious presentation because the symptoms can include inability to move your arms or legs, trouble with bowel or bladder, inability to walk. Um, and so when we see that, that often prompts us to want to use more aggressive immunosuppressive therapies um, because the symptoms are very disabling. Um, in terms of, it, it can also affect the peripheral nervous system and cause symptoms like pain and numbness and tingling and can involve the muscles. Um, and then it can also affect kind of the, the brain tissue itself, the parenchyma. And so symptoms can vary widely depending on the location of disease activity. So this is just kind of some more images to show you that, you know, imaging alone can, many different uh, neurologic problems can cause these imaging findings. So this is not diagnostic when we see these things on imaging, and, um, but we can see involvement of the deep white matter and periventricular areas. Um, the pituitary uh, can be involved and that can cause a lot of dysregulation of hormones and endocrine problems. Um, and then the third image is showing uh, cranial nerve involvement and then again, involve the spinal cord. So how we go about diagnosing neurosarcoid. So there's often a lot of overlap with um, sarcoid diagnostic testing, as many of you might, as patients might be familiar with. Um, commonly, you have a chest X-ray, um, a CT scan of chest and abdomen, pulmonary function tests, um, eye exams. You might have an endoscopic evaluation of the nose and sinuses, a PET scan. Um, sometimes, you know, bi biopsies of relevant tissues, uh, lung biopsies, et cetera. And then oftentimes blood tests are sent looking at kind of the general function of your immune system, including your immunoglobulins and your T cells and B cells and things like that. And then, um, as Dr. Nyack talked about, the histology is critical in helping nail down the diagnosis, um, as well as ruling out alternative diagnoses like infection. We do like to do lumbar punctures um, for patients that we suspect neurosarcoidosis because they can at least help guide our um, what we think is going on. So um, we look at things like the total protein level, the total number of cells in the spinal fluid, as well as the level of glucose. Um, and sometimes people will also send this ACE test, which is not as helpful in the um, cerebral spinal fluid. It's not very sensitive or specific. So it's not often used at our institution. Um, we also send 
markers for looking at IgG index or oligoclonal bands, which is a marker of MS, so we want to make sure we're not missing that. And then we look for infectious studies by sending viral PCRs, fungal studies, bacterial cultures, cytology to make sure that we're not seeing some sort of infection or some sort of cancer process. Um, so it's, there's a lot of workup that goes, involved, goes into ruling out kind of all other causes, especially if we you know, don't yet have a biopsy that's showing clear granulomatous disease. And then there's been a lot of work recently going into, you know, how do we uh, diagnose neurosarcoid and how definite we can be in that diagnosis. And that's important because the treatments that we use can often have, you know, side effects and things. So we want to be as sure as possible about what we're treating. Um, so we kind of categorize the diagnosis as being possible, probable, or definite neurosarcoid. Um, in possible neurosarcoid, it's where the, the clinical features fit, um, and then the diagnostic evaluation, the chest x-ray, the, the CT scans, the PET scans, things like that um, are all kind of pointing to a diagnosis. However, we don't have tissue pathology, and we um, haven't kind of ruled out all other causes, infection, cancer, things like that. Um, so we generally don't like to, to be in that category. Um, and then we have probable where we've ruled out kind of all other causes and we have systemic pathology, a biopsy from lung or other tissue that shows those granulomas. Um, that makes us more confident that when we see those things on MRI in the brain or spinal cord that what we're dealing with is, is neurosarcoid. And then definite neurosarcoid is when we actually have pathology from the nervous system itself, which we don't always have the luxury of having because it's an invasive procedure to do a biopsy within uh, the nervous system. So um, oftentimes we move forward with treatment and without, without that if, we're, if it's not available. So in terms of treatment strategies, um, there's, as I mentioned, currently no FDA-approved therapy as of yet. Um, and oftentimes treatment is based on experience from sarcoid as well as expert opinion, case series. The goals of therapy would be you know, sustained remission of symptoms, prevent new lesions, to minimize any drug toxicities. Um, as many of you know, steroids are first-line treatment in many cases, and then we, off, we try to find steroid-sparing agents, um, including infliximab, uh, methotrexate, and cyclophosphamide are often used. Um, so this study was just kind of looking at the impact of different therapies on relapses in uh, neurosarcoidosis, so um, both any systemic relapse as well as specifically neurologic relapses um, and found that not unexpectedly steroids were very effective in preventing um, relapses in um, both systemic and neurosarcoid. Um, also effective were methotrexate and um, Plaquenil as well as um, cyclophosphamide and infliximab. Um, less effective in these studies were azathioprine and, and myfortic or mycophenolic uh, acid. Some of the challenges to these studies, you know, as I mentioned, um, neurosarcoidosis is not extremely common. It's something we certainly see, but it often requires collaboration with multiple centers in order to really develop um, rigorous trials for different therapies. Um, and it can have such a wide variety of presentations and involve, you know, s different areas of the nervous system. We don't really have a great biomarker yet for neurosarcoidosis. That's something that's kind of active, um, actively ongoing in research. Um, and then we don't understand, you know, who's going to relapse, who's going to progress, who's going to do very poorly. Um, we wish we, we understood that better. Um, genetics might play a role in that, so there are some um, ongoing um, studies now to try to understand if genetics are playing a role in how aggressive the disease is or how likely you are to have nervous system involvement. Um, and, you know, we want to understand that because we would be more inclined to use potentially a more toxic therapy or something that's more um, aggressive if we thought that you know, the disease was going to be worse for a particular person. 
So um, where do we go from here? So Dr. Clifford has, um, for the past several years, been working to help develop collaborations with different investigators across the country, including people at Mayo and Harvard, Hopkins, Penn, um, as well as other sites listed here, and to develop a neurosarcoidosis consortium where they actively communicate and collaborate, um, talk with each other about their experiences with patients, as well as um, publish papers together and, and um, design research studies. Um, he recently submitted a um, rare diseases grant to the NIH um, that we're waiting to hear back from um, about neurosarcoidosis and that and would involve these uh, collaborators um, working on, on projects if that were funded. Um, as part of this consortium, some of the recent papers that have come out are looking at infliximab for the treatment of CNS sarcoidosis. Um, in this study, they looked at about, I believe it was 66 patients or so that were combined from multiple centers um, and looked at the use of infliximab and saw that in about 80% of patients, they had a pretty good, um, they had improvement in their MRIs, improvement in their symptoms, and that actually when they stopped infliximab, their disease process came back um, in the sites where it had been previously. Um, so suggesting that infliximab might be a, a relatively effective therapy, but more studies are needed. And then the, um, uh, the bottom study is we're still working to kind of help hone down the diagnosis and how we define what neurosarcoidosis is. And so he, um, along with the many collaborators, published this study about uh, you know how, how do we define that, how do we hone down the criteria. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank all of the um, neuropsychosis, the people involved in neuropsychosis and uh, research as well as sarcoid. As I mentioned, it's a very multidisciplinary problem um, and we rely on each other a lot to, to help with various expertise. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.